There is a language, older by far, and deeper than words. It is the language of bodies, of body on body, wind on snow, rain on trees, wave on stone. It is the language of dream, gesture, symbol, memory. We have forgotten this language. We do not even remember that it exists. In order for us to maintain our way of living, we must, in a broad sense, tell lies to each other, especially to ourselves. It is not necessary that the lies be particularly believable. The lies act as barriers to truth. These barriers to truth are necessary because without them, many deplorable acts would become impossibilities. Truth must, at all costs, be avoided. When we do allow self-evident truths to percolate past our defenses and into our consciousness, they are treated like so many hand grenades rolling across the dance floor of an improbably macabre party. We try to stay out of harm's way, afraid they will go off, shatter our delusions, and leave us exposed to what we have done to the world and to ourselves. Exposed as the hollow people we have become. And so we avoid these truths these self-evident truths and continue the dance of world destruction. As is true for most children, when I was young, I heard the world speak. Stars sang. Stones had preferences. Trees had bad days. Toads held lively discussions crowed over a good day's catch. Like static on a radio, schooling and other forms of socialization began to interfere with my perception of the animate world. And for a number of years, I almost believed that only humans spoke. The gap between what I experienced and what I almost believed confused me deeply. It wasn't until later that I began to understand the personal, political, social, ecological, and economic implications of living in a silenced world. The silencing is central to the workings of our culture the staunch refusal to hear the voices of those we exploit is crucial to our domination of them. Religion, science, philosophy, politics, education, psychology, medicine, literature, linguistics, and art have all been pressed into service as tools to rationalize the silencing and degradation of women, children, other races, other cultures, the natural world, and its members, our emotions, our consciences, our experiences, and our cultural and personal histories. My own introduction to the silencing and this is similarly true for a great percentage of children, as well within many families, came at the hands and genitals of my father, who beat my mother, my brothers, and my sisters, and who raped my mother, my sister, and me. I can only speculate that because I was the youngest, 
my father somehow thought it best that instead of beating me, he would force me to watch and listen. I remember scenes vaguely as from a dream or a movie of arms flailing, of my father chasing my brother Rob around and around the house. I remember my mother pulling my father into their bedroom to absorb blows that may have otherwise landed on her children. We sat stone-faced in the kitchen, captive audience to stifled groans that escaped through walls that were just too thin. The vagueness with which I recollect these formative images is the point here, because the worst thing my father did went beyond the hitting and the raping to the denial that any of it ever occurred. Not only bodies were broken, but broken also was the bedrock connection between memory and experience, between psyche and reality. His denial made sense, not only because an admission of violence would have harmed his image as a socially respected, wealthy, and deeply religious attorney, but more simply because the man who would beat his children could not speak about it honestly and continue to do it. We became a family of amnesiacs. There's no place in the mind to sufficiently contain these experiences. And as there was effectively no way out, it would have served no purpose for us to consciously remember the atrocities. So we learned, day after day, that we could not trust our perceptions and that we were better off not listening to our emotions. Daily we fought, and if a memory pushed its way to the surface, we forgot again. There'd be a beating, followed by brief contrition, and my father asking, why did you make me do it? And then, nothing, save the inconvenient evidence. A broken door, urine-soaked underwear, a wooden room divider my brother repeatedly tore from the wall, trying to pick up speed around the corner. Once these were fixed, there was nothing left to remember. So we forgot, and the pattern continued. This willingness to forget is the essence of silencing. When I realized that, I began to pay more attention to the how and the why of forgetting, and thus began a journey back to remembering. We don't stop the atrocities because we don't talk about them. We don't talk about them because we don't think about them. We don't think about them because they're too horrific to comprehend. As trauma expert Judith Herman writes, the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness Certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud. 
This is the meaning of the word unspeakable. We live in a world of make believe. Think of it as a little game. The only problem being that the repercussions are real. Bang, bang, you're dead. Only the other person doesn't get up. My father, in order to rationalize his behavior, had to live in a world of make believe. He had to make us believe that the beatings and the rapes made sense. That all was as it should be and must be. Now it will be obvious to everyone that my father's game of make-believe was far from fun. It was destructive. My father rewrote the script on a day-to-day -day basis, thereby making everything right. He created the reality that he required in order to continue his behavior. In attempting to describe the world in make-believe terms, we have forgotten what is real and what isn't. We pretend the world is silent, whereas in reality it is filled with conversations. We pretend we are not animals, whereas in reality, the laws of ecology apply as much to us as the rest of God's creation. We pretend we're at the top of a great chain of being, although evolution is non-hierarchical. We pretend that violence is inevitable, and in some ways it is. But can it be mitigated through better science? Rather than answer that question, most often we pretend, sheepishly, that violence doesn't exist. Science, politics, economics, and everyday life do not exist separately from ethics, but we act like they do. We act like these pretenses are reasonable, but none of them are intuitive or instinctual, nor are they logically, empirically, or ethically defensible. Taken together, a way of life based on these pretenses is destroying life on this planet but a real world still awaits us. One that is ready to speak to us. If only we would remember how to listen. When I was a child, the stars saved my life. I did not die because they spoke to me. Between the ages of seven and nine, I often crept outside at night to lie on the grass and talk to the stars. Each night I gave them memories to hold for me, memories of beatings witnessed, of rapes endured. I gave them emotions too large and sharp for me to feel. In return, the stars gave me understanding they said to me, this is not how it is supposed to be. This is not your fault. You will survive. We love you. You are good. I cannot overstress the importance of this message. Had I never known an alternative existed, 
had I believed that the cruelty I witnessed and suffered was natural or inevitable, I would have died. My parents divorced during my early teen years. It was a bitter divorce in which my father used judges, attorneys, psychologists, and most of all, money. With the same fury and relentlessness with which he had once used fists, feet, and genitals. The stars continued to foster me, speaking softly whenever I chose to listen. Time passed. I grew older. I went to college, received a degree in physics, and on my own read, a fair amount of psychology. I came to a new understanding of my place in the world. It had not been the stars that saved me, but my own mind. My earlier thesis, that the stars cared for me, spoke to me, held me, made no physical sense. Stars are inanimate. They don't say anything. They can't. And they certainly couldn't care about me. And even if they cared, there remained the problem of distance. How could a star, a thousand light years away, respond to my emotional needs in a timely fashion. It became clear that some part of my own psyche had known precisely the words I needed to hear in order to endure and projected those words onto the stars. It was a pretty neat trick on the part of my unconscious and this projection business seemed a wonderful adaptive mechanism for surviving in a world that I had come to recognize as largely insensate with the exception of its supreme tenant, humankind. I've often wished that I could have been in the room when Descartes came up with his famous quip, I think, therefore I am. I would have put my arm around his shoulder and gently tapped, or I would have punched him in the nose. I might have taken his hands in mine, kissed him full on the lips, and said, Rene, my friend, don't you feel anything? I used to believe that Descartes' most famous statement was arbitrary. Why hadn't he said, I love, therefore I am, or I breathe, therefore I have lungs, or I defecate, therefore I have eaten, or I feel the weight of the quill on my fingers and rejoice in the fact that I am alive, therefore I must be. I no longer see Descartes' statement as arbitrary. It is representative of our culture's narcissism. This narcissism leads to a disturbing disrespect for direct experience and a negation of the body. Estranged from all life, Descartes thought that everything was a dream and he the dreamer. You may have played this game too.